Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Christy Epstein, and I am the nurse practitioner on the MS team at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. I would like to welcome you to our fourth session of our virtual education series. These series are for people who are affected by MS. If you're here, you're either living with and coping with MS yourself, or you care about someone who has MS. Whatever your reason for being here tonight, we welcome you and we're very glad that you're here. We hope that this series of webinars will be informative and helpful as you manage and flourish with this disease in your daily life. So we're going to go over a few housekeeping notes and you may have seen that popping up on your screen just a moment ago. I'm just going to review. Throughout our event tonight, your mics are going to remain muted and your cameras will be turned off during the duration of the webinar. This session, like our other sessions, will be closed captioned and recorded for viewing at a later time. As you listen to the presentations, we would like you to think about your questions and go ahead and enter them in the Q&A box that you will see on the bottom of your screen. Just a gentle reminder, please do not disclose any private health information or ask any personal questions. All questions should be generally related to MS and the presentation content. At the end of our session, our wonderful panel of experts will be there to answer as many questions as possible. Tonight, I'm going to serve as the moderator for our event. I'm a nurse practitioner specializing in multiple sclerosis, and I have many special interests within our clinic. These include quality of life, wellness, reproductive issues, and clinical research. With me tonight are going to be several members of our MS team at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center, including Dr. Tirisham Gyang, Dr. Samantha Stern, Dr. Margaret Hansen, and our director, Dr. Benjamin Segal. Unfortunately, not joining us tonight will be Rebecca Furu, as she has unfortunately fallen ill. We wish her well and hope she gets well soon. I'm happy to welcome this group of experts as we walk through the journey of diagnosis, treatment, and care services for our patients at the Ohio State MS Center. Our team is a collaboration of physicians, nurse practitioners, specialists that are all committed to providing you with the care and treatment that is unique for you and your needs. This evening, we're gonna share with you information about the journey, our care philosophy, and the services that we offer through many of our specialized clinics. And we'll talk more about those along the way. These include Infusion Center, Multidisciplinary Clinic, Quality of Life Clinic, and others. Our goal is your comprehensive healthcare, and we will work as a team to help you live your best quality of life. So with that being said, we're gonna start off with a poll question. We might see these pop up throughout our session tonight. So let's do one to figure out how to interact with it. On your screen, you're gonna see the question pop up. You will click select an answer and then click submit. That's all you have to do. So let's try it out. First poll question. I have visited the Wexner Medical Center Quality of Life Clinic and have an appointment or have an appointment to visit soon. Let's go ahead and enter your responses. And remember that you want to click submit once you've selected your response. And then on your screen, we'll be able to see how many have answered. So it looks like at this time, there are a lot of people who don't, do not know about the quality of life clinic. All right, so let's move on. So the main topic for this evening's webinar, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of what an MS patient's journey would be like in our clinic. Right here, you can see on your screen that there is a little algorithm that explains sort of the journey 
in our clinic. This starts with a new patient visit, and then patients will follow along to visit the quality of life clinic and education with our clinical pharmacists about disease modifying therapy. They may also visit the multidisciplinary MS symptom management clinic, clinic, and then we'll continue to follow up regularly with physicians, nurse practitioners, PT, pharmacy, and other specialists. So we're gonna start out this evening with a look at what happens in the new patient visit. Dr. Giang is going to be joining us tonight for a presentation on what happens during the new patient visit. So I would like to briefly give an introduction to Dr. Giang. Dr. Giang? Thank you very much, Christy. And um, we're very excited to be presenting to all of you today. Um, I am just gonna share my slides. There we go. Okay, so I will be talking about what happens on the, on the first visit. So you're coming in for the first time and you're meeting with one of the MS doctors at our MS, uh, at our MS center. So I have this slide on just to show the model of care that we have. And as you can all see, the patient is in the middle and we have a lot of people around the patient. So basically we have a comprehensive care team around the patient and that could include the doctor, the nurses, a physical therapy, occupational therapy, pharmacy. We have a full team of people that surround themselves around that patient so that you know care is not fragmented and care is done in a way that is, is efficient and you know excellent care for the patient. So that's the model that we follow. Now, just one slide about uh, what to do before your first visit. So first of all, how do you even get an appointment to see one of the doctors at our a, a MS center? There are two main ways to do that. So one could be a referral from your primary doctor or your neurologist or any doctor that you know, sees you and there's a concern about MS. Uh, that doctor can send us a referral and you will be scheduled in the MS clinic. And we also accept patients that refer themselves. So basically you could just call, I have the number, the fax number and the phone number for scheduling. Uh, you can call that number. And if you want to be evaluated by one of the MS doctors, uh, as long as your insurance allows you to self-refer to our clinic, you will be scheduled in with one of our MS doctors. Uh, and just a few things about how do you prepare for that first appointment? Um, a lot of times it's helpful to write down some of the questions you want answered by the doctor. Um, a lot of times when I see patients, they say, oh, I just blanked out. You know, I had tons of questions that I wanted to ask, but I totally forgot as soon as I got in. So I think a good practice is, you know, maybe the day before you come or, you know, even right before you're in the clinic, just write down a few questions that you really want to ask the doctor to answer. Uh, prepare all your medical records. So sometimes you've had MRI scans done, you've seen other doctors, they are medical records from outside, just prepare all of them to bring to that visit. And then arrange for transportation. You know, do you need to bring somebody else with you? Do you need help with mobility? You know, do you need somebody to help explain things to you because you're gonna forget them, you know, when you hear them. So all of that is what you could do before your first visit. And then what happens on the first visit? So on the first visit, you're going to meet one of our MS doctors and we have several MS doctors that work in our center. Um, and the first thing that we do is that we take a complete history of your illness. So we ask you a lot of questions. We try to figure out what kind of symptoms have you had and how have these symptoms progressed over time? Uh, and then the second thing we do generally is that we do a complete neurologic exam and we're gonna 
you know, look at your eyes, check your muscle strength. There's a lot of things that go into that neurologic exam to look for any specific findings that may suggest MS. And then we go through all your prior medical da data. So have you had MRI scans before? Have you had some blood work before? Are there any reports from a prior doctor? We're gonna take a look at all of that. We're gonna review that and you know, have a very thorough discussion about what we find in those, uh, in those studies. And then finally, we come up with a comprehensive plan of you know, what we're gonna do next. So we put together your physical, uh, your, uh, your history, your neurologic exam, and all the workup that has been done. And then we come up with a personalized plan for you. Um, sometimes it entails doing more blood work or doing an, another MRI scan. Sometimes we're at a point where we can decide on a medication that we wanna start you on. Uh, and sometimes we would send you or we would refer you to other specialties. Uh, for instance, we could refer you to physical therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, and one specialty that we you know, always refer most, most of our patients to is a clinical pharmacy. So we do have a clinical pharmacist that works within our team. And we will be hearing from her this evening uh, about what to expect when you come for the clinical pharmacy visit. And then finally, we have a follow-up plan of what is gonna happen next and what is, who are you gonna come back to see at the follow-up? And just a last reminder of the comprehensive care team. So you're gonna see one person, but we align ourselves around you to give you the best care that you can and to empower you as you walk through uh, your journey with MS. So right now I'm going to introduce um, our clinical pharmacist. We have Dr. Hansen, Dr. Margaret Hansen with us, and she is going to talk to us about what to expect when you come for your visit with a clinical pharmacist. Dr. Hansen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yang. Let me get my slides pulled up here. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Yang. So as Dr. Yang said, I am the clinical pharmacist who works with the MS team. And I see patients at the Martha Morehouse, the Gahanna, and soon the New Albany location. Most commonly, patients are referred to me from their providers when they're newly diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or I also see patients for a number of other reasons and for ongoing lab monitoring with the MS medications. So what does a new clinical pharmacy visit look like? Uh, we have an hour scheduled because uh, we'll cover lots of information in a new visit that includes reviewing current medications to look for any possible drug interactions, also review any drug allergies that you might have. We'll spend some time reviewing immunization history and any recommendations going forward. We'll also discuss vitamin D supplementation and tobacco cessation. But most of the time is really reserved for talking about these MS medications. And so throughout the visit, patients are encouraged to bring up any questions they might have, certainly encouraged to be prepared and come with those questions before the visit. When we talk about the MS medications, some patients will come in and know which medication they'll be starting because they had already discussed that with their provider. But many come in wanting to discuss multiple MS medication options, that they have started that conversation with their provider. And so we can discuss how these medications work, what the goals, the realistic goals are with treatment with these medications, any of the common side effects or the more uncommon risks associated with these medications, and what the ongoing monitoring it is. At the visit, you may decide which medication you want to start, and I can serve as a bridge to help you get started on that process. 
Patients can also be referred sometimes for adherence if they're having trouble remembering to take their medication, if they wanna discuss pregnancy or family planning considerations. And then insurance uh, is, is a, a piece that I try to serve as a bridge so that with the specialty pharmacy or the infusion services uh, to help make sure that those insurance processes keep moving and that we get you started on the medication um, as soon as possible. Follow-up visits are scheduled with me. Um, all of these MS medications affect the immune system in one way or another. So they all do require some ongoing lab monitoring. In addition to focusing on the labs, again, we'll talk about how are you doing on the medications? Are you tolerating it? Noticing any side effects? Uh, discuss how you're taking it. And if there's any ways we can optimize how you're taking it to limit those side effects. Discuss medication adherence and ways that we can limit missed doses and what to do about missed or late doses. Also look for any new medications that could lead to drug interactions. And again, making sure that you're able to access these medications and there are no insurance issues that we need to address. At every visit, we'll check immunizations to see if there's any new recommendations. Make sure you're on a vitamin D supplement and being adequately supplemented. And of course, always there to answer questions and to relay uh, any information needed to your provider. I work closely with the providers um, and appreciate them referring new patients to me all the time. Next, I think we have a poll question about pharmacy visits. And the poll question says, talking to an MS pharmacist would help me feel more comfortable with my MS medication. Agree or disagree? Okay. Looks like we're getting responses that are largely agree, so that makes me happy, and I look forward to seeing any of you in clinic. And next, we will hear um, from Christy again. I'm excited to welcome Christy back to speak to you about two of our MS clinics that are available for you to customize your MS care at OSU. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate that warm introduction. And I can definitely verify that at any given time, you may walk through our clinic and see the three of us head to head for a sidebar discussing our patients saying, uh, what about Mr. Jones? How's he doing? Did he see you? Did he start his medicine? I can definitely verify that we work very closely as a team. And one thing I wanted to mention about our attending physicians, since that first visit is so very important, is that our attending physicians are neurologists who are specialized in the treatment of multiple sclerosis, demyelinating diseases, and autoimmune disorders of the central nervous system. So you're going to get very specific and very targeted care based on your disease process. So with that being said, I'm going to share my slides and talk a little bit more about just exactly what is this quality of life clinic. So bear with me for a moment here while I share my screen. Okay, quality of life in the multiple sclerosis clinic. We are trying to lead an initiative to achieve quality of life through a multidisciplinary approach. So what is quality of life? You might say, what does that mean to me? Um, there are various different definitions which you can read, but overall the overarching thought or feeling is, it is the degree to which an individual is healthy, comfortable, and able to participate in or enjoy their life events. Excuse me, Christy, you are not sharing your screen. Thank you for letting me know. Let's You're go welcome. here. 
it wouldn't be any fun if we didn't have any troubleshooting. And is everyone with me now? We're with you now, thank you. Okay, perfect. So as I was saying, we're trying to achieve quality of life through a multidisciplinary approach. What is quality of life? As we discussed, that's really the degree to which an individual is healthy and comfortable and able to participate in and or enjoy those life events. So as you can see with quality of life, it affects many different domains in your life, your physical status, your functional abilities, social interactions, religious and or spiritual status, economical, vocational issues, things like your job and your psychological status and well-being. And this is all very important and all of these dynamics are tied in together. So Ohio State University, as I mentioned, is leading shared efforts to achieve quality of life. So what do we do in the quality of life clinic? Here's just a little look at some of the things that we do. First of all, when you come into the clinic, we're gonna work together to come up with goals, goals that you might have for yourself and goals that we have for you. We're gonna use different tools that we have, such as screening tools, diagnostic testing, and other measures to identify some areas of deficit or specific domains specific categories that we talked about where you may have deficits or need work. Together, we're gonna to formulate a plan of integrated co-directed intervention. And within that clinic, once we gather all this information, we're able to really target the referrals that you may need, such as physical therapy, cognitive testing, maybe a visit with a dietitian, a urologist, or a neuro-ophthalmologist. So during this time, we are able to define the tools to measure success. So when we take a look during that visit, it's really a snapshot. And then what we do is we implement the interventions that we have decided on as a team and we wanna follow up. So let's say in six months or one year, we'll do another quality of life visit to see where you are. And then we're always gonna to want to reflect, refine and repeat. So what to expect, um, as we mentioned, there is gonna be some paperwork. So you're gonna come in and you'll meet with me. Um, and first thing we're gonna do is just simply talk about MS education. You know, I think a lot of times during that first visit with your attending physician, you're trying to take it all in. And as Dr. Gang mentioned, you may have questions that you did not think about. So we encourage you to write those down and you can certainly bring those questions to either your visit with your clinical pharmacist or your quality of life visit. So we'll talk about MS. What is it? How does it affect you? What things should you be aware of and when to call the physician? All of these things are going to be simply reinforcements of what your attending physician has already told you. Also during that time, if you didn't already receive this, you will get a welcome packet that has a lot of information, how to contact people within the clinic, services that are available to you and our monthly newsletter. So as I mentioned, there is some work for you to do. Uh, we're going to use survey tools. And right now those come in the forms of questionnaires and they're comprehensive. They ask you a lot of questions about how you're feeling, how you're coping and what your symptoms are. From there, we can refer you to targeted specialists and subspecialists which can now be found in our MS Multidisciplinary Management Clinic. Um, and what that means is all together in clinic, we're working towards reaching our goals. Some of our experts that are embedded in these multidisciplinary clinics include a clinical pharmacist, physical therapist, occupational therapy, speech therapy, sleep medicine, fatigue physicians, psychologists, neuropsychologists, and urologists, just to name a few. All of our experts have experience and training in the evaluation and treatment of patients with MS. So a little bit more about the quality of life visit detail. Again, we're gonna do the goals, we're gonna do disease education, and we're gonna complete the questionnaire. 
Other screening may be required. For example, we may do some testing, including bladder scanning, if you're having urinary symptoms. Uh, we may do an OCT, which is a scan that we do of your eyes, if you're having visual symptoms. We'll discuss important things that you may have questions about, including diet, exercise, and supplements. And I know a lot of you have questions about that. And within that clinic, it's my job to determine what referrals you may need that can help you reach your goals. As I mentioned before, this could include sending you for cognitive testing, physical therapy, assistive device clinic, urology, sleep clinic, or a visit with Margaret in clinical pharmacy. And again, we're gonna have regular follow-up to assess your progress and redirect if needed. So here's just a quick example of some of the things that are on these screening tools that I keep talking about. Here's some of the things that we look at. We look at your health status, your fatigue. We look at pain. We look at sexual satisfaction. We look at bladder and bowel control. We look at visual impairments. And we look at some of your perceived deficits and your mental health inventory. We use all of these tools to make a comprehensive plan. So the best way to get the best care is to take a multidisciplinary approach. Teamwork, it's pretty simple. So the screening tools that we use are available to all of our providers. All of our providers can look and see the areas of deficit that we have identified. And we use this information to better target and direct our multidisciplinary clinic. Within that multidisciplinary clinic, you can see your attending physician and our embedded specialists on the same clinic day. An example, as we've mentioned before, might include a sleep doctor or the clinical pharmacist, or you might see someone from neuropsychology for some talk therapy. Again, it's a multidisciplinary care team. So when you take a look at this picture down here, all of these areas are involved. We want to talk to you about not only your clinical care, but what research we might be doing, what's available in our rehab department, what mental health tools do we have to help you, what kind of pain are you having and how can we address that. If you're having urinary symptoms that are impacting your life, how can we make that better? If you have questions about your disease modifying therapy, how can we address that with our clinical pharmacist? We always want to advocate for our patients. I want you want to make sure that you're getting out there, enjoying life and living your best quality of life. So, you know, there's a lot of science behind what we're saying. And this is just a quick little slide to just let you know that there is a lot of evidence. And the evidence does suggest that multidimensional team approach is the most effective way of treating persons with MS. As you all know, that are probably on this webinar, there are so many different things that MS affects. So by having a large team that's specialized, we're better able to care for you in a comprehensive way. So as we mentioned before, the people in the comprehensive care team are all well-informed specialists in dealing with MS. So the team will be you, your family, your caregivers, and then all of us as providers. And you'll see here on this little uh, demographic or this little presentation of the person of MS is again in the middle. And all around you are the specialists that you might need. Neurologist, psychologist, social worker, urologist, occupational therapist, nutritionist. All of these things are involved in achieving your quality of life. So here's just a little look at some of the members of our care team here at The Ohio State University. There's Dr. Follis in the back. Um, so it's important that you meet the members of the team and our team, as we speak, is definitely growing. Some new members who are gonna be coming to us in September, Dr. Emily Harrington, um, she specializes in the care and treatment of multiple sclerosis. And she has a particular interest in finding better treatments for progressive multiple sclerosis and enhancing myelin repair with the hopes of preventing disability and neurodegeneration. She obtained her medical and graduate training at the University of California, San Francisco, and her multiple sclerosis fellowship at Johns Hopkins. She was originally from Kansas City, 
and she's very excited to become a Buckeye. Also, Dr. Zhang will be joining us hopefully in September or October. And he is also gonna be a member of our team. And he is coming to us from New York City where he received his fellowship training uh, at Mount Sinai. He also completed medical school and neurology residency at University of Texas Southwestern. So we are looking so forward to him joining our team. His research focuses on aging and MS, including how biological changes during aging contribute to the evolution of disease. So we will welcome him when he comes to our team. Dr. Khan is really not new. I just added her because some of you may not be familiar with her, but she is one of our sleep doctors and she's very important because as you all know, sleep is a critical component of wellness when dealing with multiple sclerosis. She gave a wonderful talk at one of our previous webinars. So if you'd like to go to our website and check out her talk, it is there for your viewing. So in summary, achieving quality of life is definitely an attainable goal. And it is a priority in a comprehensive patient care setting. So our focus is really gonna be on treating not only the disease process and its symptoms, but the whole individual. So the quality of life clinic at OSU can help patients identify areas of need, and this will direct the care that you need in our multidisciplinary MS symptom clinic. So we're gonna utilize these techniques to achieve wellness and promote quality of life. We're gonna do diet, exercise, mental health, disease modifying therapy. We're gonna talk about it all. So just want you to remember, that all of these things should always be approached using evidence-based practice. So quality of life is always best going to be achieved by taking that multidisciplinary approach. And let me stop sharing my screen. And next, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Stern. Dr. Stern is a wonderful neuropsychologist, and she is going to talk to you about some of the resources available should you be referred to her clinic. Thank you, Christy. Let me get my slides. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about behavioral inter health interventions that we have at OSU, but also kind of why psychology really has a place in the treatment of MS. I think uh, Christy did a really nice job outlining how we view quality of life and really take this whole person perspective. And with mental health treatment, that's really the same emphasis. So with a disease like MS, sometimes the individual uh, can really focus on the biological aspects of what's going on, focus on the disease. But what we know is that really all of these different facets, not just the physical health, but mental and cognitive health, as well as our important social roles and relationships play an integral role in how we function overall. And really seeing us as a whole person is why we have to really address all of these different facets of functioning to have optimal treatment. So treatment for MS, um, the research shows, really can be effective at addressing multiple aspects of quality of life. And we can do this not just through medications, but we can also do this through non-pharmacological behavioral health treatments. So with this kind of treatment, the goal is really not so much to make these symptoms completely go away, perhaps, but it's about learning new strategies that can reduce these symptoms, sometimes make them a go away, but really reduce the impact that they have on quality of life and give you tools in your toolbox for how you can then continue to use these over the course of your life. Honestly, this is something that's helpful for absolutely everyone, um, but, but can be particularly pertinent to individuals of the MS. So some particular treatment targets that I often work with patients on are things like mood, so addressing issues of depression or anxiety, sometimes broader issues about adjusting to having a chronic illness like MS and what that could mean for the individual and how they imagine their future and how they want to you know, think about their goals for themselves. Other issues like things like fatigue and issues of sleep that will certainly exacerbate symptoms that people are experiencing both emotionally, but also often physically, problems with chronic pain, and lastly, also cognitive symptoms. 
So why is this an issue? And again, this isn't just an issue for patients with MS, but we do know that MS poses unique challenges for folks. So having MS or any kind of chronic illness can certainly be very stressful. And when you have a condition like MS, st stress is of key concern because those kinds of symptoms can exacerbate um, your actual disease. And so what we wanna do is think about ways that we can mindfully address stress. Um, we also know that because MS is a disease that occurs in the brain, there can be disease specific reasons why we see emotional symptoms as well. So learning strategies can really help with that in addition to just dealing with this overall stress of living with MS. We do unsurprisingly see higher rates of depression and anxiety. And I point this out because I wanna really highlight that this is a pretty normal experience that a lot of individuals are struggling with. The good thing about this is that we have a lot of really effective evidence-based treatments that can address these symptoms in pretty short amounts of time. I wanted to dispel a couple myths about emotional symptoms among patients with MS. So one myth is that Anyone with a disease like MS or other chronic illness will be depressed. This is absolutely not true. And we see this time and time again, that individuals have a lot of personal resilience for dealing with challenges. And sometimes things that look negative at first can actually have silver linings that can then promote quality of life and overall well-being and meaning in life. So absolutely not everybody who has MS will be depressed. Also, there's this myth that people with MS and depression will look or act a certain way that's consistent with depression. There's no prototypical look to somebody who's depressed. We all experience this and cope with this in a different way. And so somebody who maybe looks happy in some contexts doesn't mean that they're not struggling in other contexts. And that's a pretty normal experience. So just because Sometimes maybe your loved one or even yourself, you feel happy doesn't mean there couldn't be some strategies that might be helpful uh, for learning how to cope with aspects of the stress that you're experiencing. Another myth is that depression and grief are the same thing. Being diagnosed with a disease like MS or having any difficult experience in your life is going to be accompanied by maybe sometimes a sense of loss and it's appropriate to grieve that loss. And just because you're grieving a loss or reimagining what you might be thinking for the next year or so of your life does not mean that you are depressed. That being said, additional support is often helpful and can be helpful for anybody, whether or not they're struggling with depression or even a normal grieving process. Another myth is that visible MS symptoms are the most difficult to cope with. And sometimes people feel, well, just because I'm not experiencing maybe physical disability in the form of changes to my walking or balance doesn't mean that, you know, means I shouldn't have to seek any kind of help or treatment in coping with this. Cognitive symptoms can actually be quite debilitating as well as fatigue. And so seeking treatments that can be helpful for addressing adjustment to those symptoms is just as valid. And last, fatigue and cognitive dysfunction are not related to depression. In fact, what we've seen across studies is that fatigue and cognitive dysfunction and depression can kind of go hand in hand. So often fatigue can exacerbate these other things or depression can exacerbate feelings of fatigue and these in turn can then exacerbate cognitive dysfunction. So they all kind of can play off of each other. And this kind of goes to this other point that I wanted to highlight because oftentimes people don't think about seeking psychotherapy for things like fatigue, sleep, and pain. This is actually an area where we can be particularly helpful as we have a lot of evidence-based treatments that are focused on strategies that can help patients learn how to cope with these kinds of symptoms. Again, our goal is not to change your sleep patterns um, medically, but really learn strategies such as sleep hygiene techniques that can help you fall asleep easier or learn relaxation strategies that can be helpful. Similarly with fatigue and pain, we're often looking at ways that we can enhance your activity levels while also not exacerbating your fatigue so that you can live a more kind of functional life doing the things that you like to do. So we want to address these symptoms because we see consistently that these things all tend to play off of each other and make things worse emotionally for folks, but they can also exacerbate cognitive dysfunction. That being said, a lot of individuals experience cognitive changes after MS, and this can vary really greatly amongst folks. So oftentimes I hear complaints of, I feel kind of foggy, or I'm not able to think as clearly, or I can't focus, or also problems with memory, problems remembering day-to-day -day information. 
Um, as my colleagues have mentioned, we can do standardized assessments to capture kind of where you're at in terms of your thinking abilities through a standard neuropsychological assessment. And that's one of the services that we can definitely offer and be helpful for. But after that, we can also treat those cognitive difficulties that we identify by learning strategies to help compensate for those kinds of weaknesses. Oftentimes folks are a little apprehensive about what psychotherapy might look like. So I just wanted to go through what that will typically look like so that you know that we're, we're not too scary. Um, really first you'd meet with a clinical psychologist or a therapist. We'll review your background and symptoms, see what's going on and what we could potentially help with. Identifying specifically what your needs and goals for treatment would be as it's all person focused. So there's no run of the mill, this is how we do this. It's all tailored around what you're interested in. And that's a collaborative process. It's something that we want to be a good fit for you and not every therapist is going to be a good fit for that individual. So it's important for us to figure that out um, so that we can move forward with an appropriate treatment plan. If treatment is deemed appropriate and there's good goals that we've identified together, then sessions will look like learning coping strategies to, to address these different kinds of symptoms. So if you're having problems with some symptoms of depression and maybe fatigue, We'll work in session on providing education about these symptoms and then practice coping strategies that would be helpful for that. Outside of session, that's when you do the hard work. You practice these strategies, see if it's helpful. And then when you come back, we review what your experience was like, problem solve any difficulties you've encountered and make some adjustments to make it more effective. The goal for our therapy is to be evidence-based and time limited. This is not a, a treatment where you're going to be seeing us for years and years on end as much as we would like to see your smiling faces. Typically we do this in no more than 12 sessions um, and then we can schedule booster sessions as needed. This is just a sampling of some of the effective strategies and I've already highlighted a lot of these. I think a key point to take away is that a lot of these strategies have crossover. So learning relaxation strategies, for example, can be really helpful for helping with stress and mood. It can also be really helpful for addressing sleep and things like pain and fatigue. So our evidence-based strategies often can help in multiple domains. And that's why we're able to do things in a pretty time-limited fashion, where you can learn some strategies, learn how to maximize them and use them effectively. And then those are tools that you can have for your whole life. It's also a great way to um, really kind of process what this experience has been like being diagnosed with MS and to clarify for yourself how you wanna move forward and continue doing the things that you love to do. These are things that aren't maybe strategy focused, but in processing that with somebody that's sometimes outside of your circle, it helps you clarify your thoughts and then move forward in a really productive and meaningful way. Here are some helpful resources as well to definitely check out. Uh, all of this will be provided in our slides that you'll be able to access after our event. But I really encourage people to um, consider seeing a behavioral health specialist. Um, I would be happy to see you. And there's a lot of things that I think we can be helpful with. So to think, break out of the mold of what we traditionally think of as psychotherapy and think of all the possibilities that we might be able to facilitate and offer. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Stern. That was a great talk and hopefully everyone's feeling a little bit more comfortable with doing a little talk therapy. All right, so I really apologize to everyone that our wonderful specialist in uh, physical therapy and rehab was not able to join us, um, but we do have a very extensive program over there, including you know, lots of rehabilitation therapies. There's cognitive rehab, uh, there are so many things to get involved with, and I promise that we will have her back um, to discuss some of the things that are available. And all of the providers that are within our clinic can place referrals to the various things that you may need, including speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. Um, we have so many different sites and locations and exciting things like aqua therapy, so many things that are being done. Um, so I hope that we can have her back in the future and uh, we'll look forward to hearing what she has to say. In the meantime, if you have any questions about those services, feel free to ask any one of us. And I want to encourage you while we're talking about questions to get those questions into the Q&A box. 
Uh, we're going to go over those at the end of our talk. So keep those coming and let's get some of those in there. Uh, so now it's going to be my pleasure to introduce Dr. Benjamin Segal. He is the chair of the Department of Neurology and he is the director of our Multiple Sclerosis Center at the Ohio State Wexner Medical Center. Um, he is internationally known and respected as a thought leader in MS. He's published over a hundred original research articles in very high impact journals. His research is supported by annual funding from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in excess of $1.3 million. Dr. Segal, has been in the best doctors in America since 2010. And he has received multiple research awards, including the prestigious Harry Weaver Neuroscience Scholar Award from the National MS Society. Dr. Segal is gonna be sharing with us some exciting updates on all the MS research that's happening around here at OSU. And he's gonna talk about some opportunities on how to, you can become involved in MS research and clinical trials. Welcome, please, Dr. Sillong. Thank you, Christy, for that kind introduction. And I just wanna say that it is such a privilege to be working with all these fine clinicians and providers at The Ohio State University. This group has grown dramatically over the past two years, and we really are providing first-rate, cutting-edge, multidisciplinary care in a very unique uh, manner, as you outlined, Christy and Drs. Giang, Stern, and uh, Hansen. So um, it really is a source of pride for me to, to be part of this wonderful group. So in addition to the great clinical advances that have been made at Ohio State, we also are growing in terms of MS research by leaps and bounds. I'm gonna share some of my slides in order to illustrate some of the studies that we've started here. Okay, do you all see my slides? Yes. We do. Okay, excellent. So I, I just wanted to start with this first slide to illustrate the growth in terms of research in MS at OSU in, in just two, year, two years. So we have groups of or teams of scientists and technicians working on animal models of multiple sclerosis. We can induce an MS-like disease in mice in order to better understand the pathways that lead to damage in multiple sclerosis and to find new treatments for the disease. And on the left, I've listed some of the very talented scientists and innovators um, right here at The Ohio State University. Now, in red, I have highlighted um, faculty members and scientists who have just joined us, actually, um, or are joining us um, within the last uh, three months. In purple, are investigators who came to Ohio State within the last two years. And then we have um, faculty who have been here for quite a while and, and are collaborating with the new folks shown in, in the black font. We also have been growing in terms of clinical trials. And uh, once again, on the right, I'm listing all of these wonderful new doctors and scientists, clinical trial coordinators, um, and technicians um, now working to find new cures and to better understand MS by working directly with patients and human samples. Once again, in red are people who um, have joined the, the team within the last um, year, in purple within the last two years. So I think it is such an exciting time and we continue to grow and expand. This is just the beginning. Now, we, we are studying many different aspects of multiple sclerosis, but I'm gonna concentrate this evening on four main topics. Um, one is progressive multiple sclerosis and the role of aging in the disease. Then I'm gonna discuss some clinical trials that are about to start here at 
Ohio State of new drugs in both progressive and relapsing disease. We'll also talk about some really cutting edge investigations into how we can actually repair the damaged nervous system in multiple sclerosis as well as other disorders. And then I'll talk about a trial of, of Dr. Yang's evaluating the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine in people with MS. So um, this cartoon at the bottom of this slide illustrates the most uh, frequent way in which multiple sclerosis proceeds over time. The solid bar at the, at the, uh, um, in the middle of the graph indicates degree of disability against time. So the bumps shown here are actually relapses, so, or clinical attacks. So as many of you know, in the vast majority of cases, about 85% of people with MS start with this relapse limiting course, where they have symptoms and signs which last weeks to months. Eventually those die down and ebb away. Sometimes people return to baseline, but if you have MS, then weeks, months, or even years later, you'll have a, another attack and thereafter more attacks. MS, when it starts this way, is usually a disease of young adults or early middle age adults. So it usually starts in the 20s and 30s. But um, many patients over time, when they enter middle age, will evolve into a progressive course where the attacks actually slow down or even stop completely, but they're overtaken by a slow decline. Whereas someone will say, you know, I'm not walking as well today as I was six months ago. My leg is weaker. I have a foot drop. But they can't tell you exactly when the symptoms started or necessarily how quickly they evolved because they're relatively slow. But it is during this phase of disease where a lot of permanent disability accumulates and, 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 and persists um, in a more permanent way. That's called progressive MS. And interestingly, the progressive type of MS seems to be very closely associated with aging. So most people who start with a relapsing remitting course who then enter the progressive phase do so in their 40s and 50s. About 15% of people with MS will never have the relapsing remitting disease, but enter a progressive phase from the initiation of their disease. That's called primary progressive MS, and that usually starts in the 40s and 50s. So there's a very close association with the type of MS you have, the pattern of symptoms and signs, and age. Now, why is this? So there's increasing um, studies trying to understand how the aging process in, intersects with the type of abnormal inflammation in the brain and spinal cord and optic nerves that occur during MS to cause this switch from a relapsing remitting to a progressive course. Now we wanted to see, I mentioned that we could work, we could induce MS-like disease in, in laboratory animals and mice actually. We wanted to see if the age of mice would dictate the type of MS-like disease they experienced. And here at OSU, we've done some experiments um, with actually middle-aged and young mice. So this graph on the left shows the clinical course or how quickly and how permanently the mice experience leg weakness during this MS-like syndrome. And in the open squares at the top and with the gray borders, that shows the course in middle-aged mice. Uh, analogous to humans in their 40s or 50s, and the black filled circles represent the disease in the younger mice. So just as we observe in people with MS, there's a more progressive course in, a, in, um, in the middle-aged mice where they don't undergo that remission. Their symptoms don't um, dissipate at all. So this is perhaps you know, one of the uh, first models we have that looks more like progressive MS. In the past, we were um, 
somewhat um, disadvantaged in studying progressive MS because many of the mouse or animal models looked more like relapsing disease. But now that we've induced this MS-like syndrome in middle-aged mice, it begins to take on some of the features of progressive MS. So now we could ask more questions about what is underlying this, this form of the disease. And one thing that we've noticed is that um, a lot of the differences between the young and the middle-aged mice to get this MS-like syndrome has to do with a particular cell. It's located in the brain and spinal cord and the optic nerves called a microglial cell. So a microglial cell is normally present in the nervous system and it's an immune-like cell. It's an inflammatory-like cell. And it is present in the nervous system to protect us from infections. So normally the, those, the, the microglial cells are quiet, they're dormant. But when there's some type of a threat, like a viral infection or a bacterial infection, they become activated and they could trigger local inflammation. Normally that's good if the microglia are fighting off an infection, but in multiple sclerosis, inflammation actually becomes destructive and healthy tissue is uh, damaged in the absence of infections. So it turns out that in the, the middle-aged mice, the microglial cells become more activated than in the younger mice. They become more pro-inflammatory and they do this almost spontaneously. So that gave us a clue that maybe an abnormal microglial response could have something to do with the progressive form of the disease. And we're continuing to study this. Now, interestingly, when we look at the brains of patients with progressive MS, we see a certain type of lesion or plaque that we don't see so often in relapsing uh, remitting MS. And this is called a smoldering lesion, and it's illustrated on this slide. So here is, this is an image of the, the brain of someone with MS and the red circle is outlining a smoldering plaque, plaque. So these plaques tend to expand slowly over time. We don't see that so much in relapsing or remitting disease. Usually in relapsing or remitting disease, plaques form very quickly. They're very um, inflamed and then they begin to regress and that correlates with the clinical recovery. Here in progressive MS, these smoldering uh, plaques or lesions just slowly grow. And there's some evidence that these growing lesions actually correlate or are associated with neurological decline over time. Now on the right, this is from one, a paper that we published a few years ago. This is actually brain tissue from someone with MS who died and um, this is a magnified um, view of a smoldering plaque. So in this particular image, the, um, the, the dark area um, is um, uh, showing where there's normal tissue, normal brain tissue. The light area is showing the area occupied by this smoldering lesion. So the brown is actually staining a substance called myelin, which many of you probably know is an insulating covering around nerve fibers that normally protect the nerve fibers and help them function efficiently. And in multiple sclerosis, the myelin is damaged and stripped off the nerve fibers. So here where we have this pale area, it's because there's a lack of myelin, it's been stripped off of, of the, the, the nerve fibers and that this is where the plaque is. But the reason I'm showing you this is next to the, the image um, right here is another image where we have uh, stained the section in a way that highlights microglial cells. And these little dark brown dots are microglial cells. So they're at the edge of the expanding lesion and they're inflamed, and they are probably what is driving this slow growth of the lesion. So these smoldering lesions, here's an a cartoon of one, they grow 
outward over time. And right at the rim, the outer rim, are these microglial cells, and we could actually see them uh, stripping myelin directly off nerve fibers. They're actually eating up the myelin. So, you know, from the mouse models that we now have of the progressive disease, which are new, as well as from studies of brain tissues from people with MS, um, we uh, think that if we could calm down those microglial cells at the rim of those smoldering lesions, maybe we could halt the disability uh, uh, accumulation in people with progressive MS. So this actually leads into one of the uh, clinical trials that we're about to start here at the Ohio State. These trials are actually being led by Dr. Giang, and the, they are of a new drug, new type of drug called a BTK inhibitor. So BTK is an enzyme and it's found in immune cells. Interestingly, two of the most important cells where BTK is expressed are B cells and microglial cells. So B cells are another form of inflammatory cell and, and um, B cells are important in um, the uh, underlying causes of relapsing multiple sclerosis and early progressive multiple sclerosis. Many of you probably know about the drug Ocrevus, also called Ocrelizumab, or a new drug uh, uh, called uh, Pesimta. These drugs actually deplete B cells and they decrease the risk of MS attacks during the relapsing remitting phase. There's also some evidence that Ocrevus in some patients early in the progressive stage may slow the disease. So the BTK inhibitors actually turn off B cells. So, so they may be therapeutically effective in relapsing MS and early progressive MS. But I also told you that these BTK inhibitors could turn off microglial cells that are activated. This gives us hope that they would also be effective in uh, more um, advanced progressive multiple sclerosis. So this trial is about to start and what's so exciting is that we have one trial in relapsing remitting disease and another in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Here's a, a photo micrograph of a microglial cell shown in red. And actually this microglial cell contains the BTK enzyme. And that's important for it to maintain an activated state. So, you know, we know that these, this drug, this BTK inhibitor can diffuse into the brain and we're hoping it will get to the rim of those smoldering lesions and, um, and prevent the further expansion of those lesions in people with progressive MS. So these are uh, called phase three trials because they're larger trials that are more definitive. And um, the primary progressive MS trial um, will have people who are randomized either to the active drug or to a placebo. And in the relapsing remitting trial, they'll either be placed on this drug or another approved MS drug called Albagio or teraflunamide. I should have mentioned this but this, the BTK inhibitor we're testing is a pill. So we're very excited about that. And Dr. Giang is getting all the, her ducks in the row. And so, is, so are the clinical, the clinical trial coordinators. And we hope to begin enrolling patients in the near future. So that's a clinical trial that's about to commence. But there are, more, there are other studies we're doing, which are a little bit more preliminary. They're in earlier stages. Um, they're being done at the bench in our labs here at Ohio State in, in animals right now. And one of our big goals is to find ways to repair damage in the brain, spinal cord, and optic nerves in people with MS. You know, the drugs that we have now in relapsing or remitting disease could prevent damage. They decrease uh, relapses or the chance of relapses, but none of the drugs that we have actually trigger repair or healing. 
So we need to do a better job and find new ways to reverse disabilities. And one strategy is actually to use the immune system to repair the damaged nervous system. Now that may sound um, confusing because the immune system the, uh, causes the destructive uh, inflammation that leads to injury and multiple sclerosis. But there are different types of inflammatory responses. And some inflammatory responses actually have been shown to be involved in the healing process. And we want to capitalize on those particular types of inflammatory responses to develop new therapies to treat people with neurological diseases, including multiple sclerosis. So my team at Ohio State earlier uh, this year published a paper where we describe a very unusual new um, immune cell that actually stimulates the regrowth of um, severed nerve fibers. And here's an illustration of those cells. Here's a close-up. And on your right, these are optic nerves from mice that had been crushed. And normally, the, the nerve on the top, if you don't do anything, there's really almost no regrowth. But if we introduce these special immune cells into the eye, it triggers this very robust regrowth of the damaged nerves. So we do know that in optic neuritis, which occurs in multiple sclerosis and, and leads to visual uh, deficits, that there is damage to the nerve fibers. And the hope is that we will be able to find ways to trigger the expansion and the migration of these healing cells to uh, MS plaques in the, in the optic nerves, but also in the brain and spinal cord to trigger some type of recovery. Um, now, th these studies uh, up to now that we've published have been done in mice, but we are very actively trying to discover a similar type of healing immune cell in humans. And these cells actually are very immature. They're stem cell-like. So we decided to look in umbilical cord blood to see if we could find uh, um, immune healing cells um, from human specimens. And this is very early on, but it looks like we have begun to, to identify cells shown here, human cells, that trigger nerve fiber growth. So here's a nerve fiber that has grown in response to some of these healing immune cells. This is a, a nerve cell in a dish. So we're excited about this, and we have a lot of people working on this project to figure out how we could better characterize these human cells and expand them and engineer them and hopefully one day use them as a cell therapy. Now, there's a lot of ways in which immune cells interact with, with cells in the nervous system. And you know, so there's a yin and a yang. There is bad inflammation and there's good inflammation. And, Dr. and uh, Christy Epstein uh, um, told you about um, a, a new faculty member, a new doctor who is joining us in September. She's actually on this call today, Emily Harrington. And Emily Harrington is a scientist and a doctor. And she has studied how immune cells cause damage to the myelin producing cells in the nervous system with you know, the ultimate goal of blocking that damage. But there's also some data indicating that alternative types of immune cells, which may be related to the immune cells I mentioned earlier that trigger nerve fiber regrowth, could actually also stimulate new myelin formation. So myelin is, you know, we, we do see severed nerve fibers in MS plaques, but we also see some nerve fibers that have survived, but the myelin's been stripped off of them and they don't function as well. So we, we need to develop ways to drive new myelin formation. Uh, that's called remyelination. And there's some evidence that some immune cells may be able to do that. And we're studying that. And I think Dr. Harrington's gonna be studying that as well as many other uh, projects. So um, 
Lastly, I wanted to talk about an active trial that you may have heard about during our previous talks and webinars, but this is the COVID-19 vaccine trial, once again being run by Dr. Yang. And she's posing the question, does MS affect the response to the COVID-19 vaccine? Are there MS drugs that suppress response to the COVID vaccine? You know, so as you know, a lot of the MS drugs suppress immune responses, um, including B cells that produce protective antibodies, the type of antibodies that the vaccine is designed to elicit. And we don't know to what extent or not different MS drugs could interfere with the effectiveness of the vaccine. This is important to know because, you know, down the line, it may um, lead to recommendations for booster vaccines in, in, in certain individuals. What's very exciting is that Dr. Yang has forged a collaboration with a scientist in the veterinary school at Ohio State who has developed a very special test to measure the response to the COVID-19 vaccine. This test actually measures the antibodies that neutralize or inactivate the COVID-19 virus. And that's a special test that is unique to Ohio State. So um, the idea is to obtain blood from people with MS, ideally before they get vaccinated. And then again, afterwards, if uh, if, if a person is willing, maybe get blood tests even after that to see how durable the anti-COVID-19 um, response is. But we're also accepting people who've gotten the COVID-19 vaccine already and want to know if they have generated a good response, even if we can't get the blood sample before the vaccination. So here is a flyer advertising the COVID-19 study, which, I, which is actively enrolling. And one thing I want to leave you with is this information on how you could get involved in clinical trials and studies at OSU. One easy way is via email. And the email address is msresearch at osumc.edu. So that's msresearch at osumc.edu. You could also call a telephone number, 614-293-6486, and talk to one of our clinical trial coordinators. If you're interested in an appointment in, an, in the MS clinic at OSU, uh, we also have listed the phone number that you could call to make that appointment, 614-293-4969. But we will make this information available after the webinar as well. So thank you so much. Um, I, the, the last thing I'd like to do is to introduce, we're so excited that Dr. Emily Harrington is joining us. She actually is already in Columbus, um, settling in, but will uh, actually start um, on faculty next month. Uh, Dr. Harrington is a very talented physician scientist. We were so, um, overjoyed to uh, recruit Emily from uh, Johns Hopkins University, where she's doing a fellowship. She's studying with um, one of my old buddies, Peter uh, Calabrese, who's a leading MS researcher there. And she's also um, uh, working with a really out outstanding um, neuroscientist, uh, Dwight Burgles. And uh, I am so happy that she's going to be a collaborator and a clinician on our team. So welcome, Emily. Thank you, Dr. Segal. I'm very excited to be here. OK, well, now we have about 10 or 15 minutes to answer questions, um, which you may have um, entered if you haven't. Uh, you could type in a, a question through the Q&A uh, feature the, those um, at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the icon with the, with the bubbles and the Q&A under them, you could write in a question and we'll be happy to answer it. So um, I'm going to uh, start out with a question. Um, I'm going to actually address this question to 
our newest member, Dr. Harrington. So Dr. Harrington, I, you are a, an MS doctor who sees patients and cares for them. You're also working at the bench on uh, mouse models of MS to better understand the disease and to find new cures. Could you talk about how you combine those efforts? That seems like a lot. And how your clinical practice benefits your research and vice versa. Okay, good question. Um, so I, I think uh, we have the advantage of learning so much from some of the mouse models that we use to study in MS. And while you think a, mice, a mouse might not be much like a human, actually there's quite a lot of similarities in terms of how mice uh, repair themselves um, and how we can study that um, and translate that to patient care. So I think um, I, I really enjoy doing the research part of it because I, I feel like I directly learn things that are applicable to patients and that we can try to get into trials or and try to test um, um, that may benefit and help some of these uh, repair strategies that Dr. Segal mentioned. So um, that's my ultimate goal. And I think um, we've already have several good um, examples of things that have been tested in the lab and the bench that um, have have been uh, that are currently being studied, like he mentioned. So, um, yeah, I think I think that's one uh, key advantage of of what we have going on at, at the Ohio State. Thank you, uh, Dr. Harrington. Now, I'd like to ask kind of a global question and have a bunch of uh, our panelists chime in. You know, we've been doing these multidisciplinary clinics um, for a little while now. Uh, Christy, you've been doing the quality of life clinic, which has become so popular. And one of the wonderful things is that we're all together in the same corridor and could talk about patients and, and curbside one another. Also, it's convenient for patients that they don't have to make multiple trips and may be able to see one provider after another. And I have seen, I have spoken uh, a lot to uh, Dr. Hansen about patients, you know, in the clinic and through our electronic medical record um, and with uh, Dr. Stern about, um, in, in fact, there have been times when I saw a patient who really was undergoing an emotional crisis or issue. And uh, I knocked on Dr. Stern's door and said, could you fit this patient in? I think she or he would really benefit. And, and Dr. Stern's always accommodated uh, uh, us. And, you know, Dr. Yang and, and, and Christy, we're often talking in the, uh, in the staff room about how we could best serve our patients or if, I, if I'm perplexed about something or Dr. Yang wants me to look at a scan or I want her opinion or Christy, Christy's opinion. So could um, maybe Christy, you could start off and, and, and comment on how that, that really works and gels and, and has it been a real uh, change and a positive um, development in the way we see patients? Thank you, Dr. Segal. It, it most definitely has. And I will say that as providers, I think that we all really enjoy sharing the same corridor and having those resources available to us. Um, and the thing we always remember and the thing that I appreciate the most about The Ohio State University is one of the things that you mentioned. Not only do we have these excellent providers, but behind the scenes, we just got an inside look into the amazing groundbreaking research that's being done. And that is really the advantage of the Ohio State University as an academic center. We can fall back on those very, very strong pillars of knowledge and research that's being advantaged uh, or that's being undertaken within the university. And then the other thing I would mention is those wonderful multidisciplinary days that we have. Um, there are also times where patients might be just in the same building. We've had patients just go down a couple floors and see somebody over in physical therapy. Um, I sent a little secure chat down to Grace Schaffner, Dr. Schaffner, who's not here tonight and said, hey, can you see this patient really quickly and do a quick assessment? 
sent the patient down the elevator and they came back up and made it up on time for their appointment with Dr. Stern. So I think that this teamwork has really, really, really improved the quality of care that we are able to provide. And I know from a patient standpoint, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about getting a lot of things done during one visit because many of our patients come from you know, quite a distance, up to two hours or more away. Thank you, Christy. That's great to hear. Uh, a question just was um, uh, entered into the Q&A by one of um, our listeners. So uh, Tricia says, I just joined this meeting. Um, I have a question for the panelists about lifestyle medicine and your thoughts on reversing MS symptoms through a whole food plant-based lifestyle. Now, um, I think uh, several of the physicians um, would be interested in addressing that for the practitioners. I know, Christy, you're very interested in dietary modifications, but since you just, I just asked you a question, I'm gonna <laughs> direct this one to Dr. Yang, and then maybe if you have comment, and I know Dr. Harrington's very interested in diet too. So let's start with Dr. Yang. Sure, I'll say a few words, but uh, you know, I think the more people talk about this, the better. Um, and this is a question we get, you know, on a very regular basis. Like, what is the MS diet? Like, you know, is there a special formula uh, that, you know, we should be talking to people about? Uh, and the answer is we don't have any specific diet that has shown evidence to either stop relapses or slow the progression of MS. So we don't have like a special code formula that says everybody with MS should be on this diet. But we do always advocate for a healthy diet. And if we think about, you know, in medical literature, what are the different diet types that have the most um, evidence in, in medicine? You know, one of them is the Mediterranean diet, which you know, we talk about emphasizing anti-inflammatory fats, so we could get that in things like olive oil, fish, avocado. Uh, these are anti-inflammatory types of fats that are in some way protective uh, to, to us. And we know with cardiovascular disease, they, it, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, a diet like that can help mitigate some of the uh, comorbidities that come from cardiovascular disease. So we talk about, you know, healthy anti-inflammatory fat, vegetables, fruit, limiting the processed stuff, um, the sugars, the white flowers, you know, that should be at a, at a minimum. And then minimizing saturated fat, like cutting down on foods that have a lot of saturated fat because sometimes it can be inflammatory. Um, so that is the general recommendation I give my patients. Um, sometimes I get, you know, Webs I've been sent different websites and different articles about, you know, a special MS diet. You know, I always advocate that you should be very conscious of your diet. You should uh, try to get a very good, you know, good antioxidants, a lot of vegetables, fruits, uh, but the diet by itself can't replace your disease modifying drug. Because sometimes patients say, you know, I just want to stop all the drugs and just focus on my diet. We really want you to do both most of the time because there's no evidence that diet by itself can replace a disease modifying drug. So that's what I have to say. I don't know if anybody has anything more. <laughs> a great answer. Uh, Drs. Harrington, uh, Emily Christie. I agree with Dr. Gang. That's exactly what I was going to say. So. <laughs> Yeah, one of the things I always say is, you know, unfortunately, we there is no evidence that any diet can sort of undo the confusion or the error that's happened in the immune system to cause the process that's going on in MS. So a diet, a really good diet can help reduce the inflammatory side of things. It can help reduce overall inflammation and it can help your cells function to the best of their ability in your body. Gut health, overall health, sleep, diet, all of these things will reduce inflammation, which in turn can help 
with your disease modifying therapy to maximize your response. Great answer. Um, okay, I think we're coming towards the, the um, end of our time. And I think that, um, Christy, you're gonna um, clo close us out, right? I am. There was just one quick question that I had that someone wanted to ask the panel. And the question was, if are clinical trials only for patients whose therapy isn't working? Uh, Dr. Gang, maybe you could address that. Sure. Um, so in general, for the clinical trials, we typically have an inclusion and exclusion criteria for each clinical trial. And so for anyone that's interested in a specific trial or just to hear about the different clinical trials that we have going on, you know, we typically would see you in the clinic. As I said in the first uh, uh, presentation, we get a complete history about you, your MS, what you've been on, and we look at your MRI scans. And then depending on uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, if you are an eligible candidate for that clinical study, you know, we can talk to you about what we do, what we're going to do in the study. We talk to you about the risks, the benefits, and then you go through the informed consent uh, process. So basically we look at the criteria for including a patient, a patient into the trial and the different clinical trials have different criteria. So for instance, you know, for some of them, you would have to have at least a relapse within a certain time frame. Uh, or not be doing well on a medication or be you know, relatively newer in your diagnosis. So it just all depends on um, what the protocol of that clinical trial uh, says. And then we also have other trials that are looking at, you know, maybe looking at other things that we're exploring like some symptomatic medications. So depending on what we're studying, we will have criteria for who can be eligible for that clinical trial. Thank you, Dr. Gang. And I'd like to go ahead and thank all of our panelists and all of our guests who joined us tonight. And I wanted to let you know that available in clinic, you will see in the checkout area, our newsletter, which has a lot of information about things that are going on in clinic and does include information about clinical trials and contact information. So, as we said at the beginning of this event, all of these talks are recorded and are available on our website. So we would like to invite you to log on to wexnermedical.osu.edu slash MS community to learn about the updates that are happening in our MS program. This will include details about this and future sessions in this virtual education series. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek. We're probably going to cover fatigue at our next event. So look forward to that. So any of the questions that we didn't have time to get to today, we will put on our question and answer session and post the answers on the webpage in the coming days, along with the presentations, and you'll see the video from tonight's event. I wanna thank all of you and our colleagues for sharing their time and their expertise with us this evening. I want to encourage everyone for ease of communication to sign up for my chart to find out about events and communicate with your doctors, your providers, and schedule appointments. Thank you for attending, and we would love to learn about you and how we can care for you and your MS, and how we can provide support as caregivers and the people who are caring for people who have MS. You can schedule an appointment with one of our physicians on our website by calling 614-482-2077. We so look forward to seeing you in one of our clinics very soon. Mark your calendar for our next virtual MS event, which is going to be on December 9th. Thank you and good night.